uh, Simon, I was going to uh, ask you in a minute just to comment on whether you've heard in your uh, report when you spoke to people about what they, the, the Gazans themselves, what they would like, what kind of help, governmental help from overseas they'd like. But first, let me ask Robert Turner uh, whether you have a theory on how governments can actually help you guys to deliver the aid that you need to deliver. What is the role of governments like the UK apart from giving money? I think it's, it's not assistance um, that we need in delivering assistance. We can deliver assistance. What we need is a change in the context so we don't need to deliver so much assistance. Exactly. So um, where we need assistance from, from governments like the UK, and, and particularly those governments that have uh, strong relationships with the Israeli government, um, is political support and political pressure to reduce the restrictions on the freedom of movement for people and goods, because the only answer for for the poverty in Gaza is is access to markets. It's uh, it's jobs, and I, that's where the the most support is required. I mean, we can continue to deliver assistance if international community wants to continue to give us uh, huge amounts of money on an annual basis. We can continue to mitigate the effects of this man-made humanitarian crisis. We mm -hmm. can do that. Um, however, that's all we're doing, is we're mitigating those effects. Um, we're not improving the situation. We're just hopefully stopping it from getting a lot worse. And, and that's, that's not a solution. The solution is that people need to be able to work. So basically, all the help that you can give is political. And does the UK have enough political weight in Israel and Palestine to be able to to provide this pressure that would alleviate some of these difficulties. Well, do, I, do, do, realistically, do you think the UK has the political? No, weight not there? on its own. The UK has to. The, the, there are a number of issues here. The UK has uh, a huge amount of influence in in the international community, both at the European level as well as with the Americans. So the UK uh, needs to work uh, in sync with its European allies to make sure that we have a strong voice in the, in the discussions at the international level and that we can apply pressure on our American allies to lead uh, the way in helping to resolve this conflict. Of course, the UK on its own it's can't resolve the Middle East conflict, sadly. If only that were the case, then perhaps we, you know, by applying lots of domestic pressure, we can get more results. But that's not, of course, that's not the case. But we have a very important role to play. Uh, and I believe that the British government needs to uh, step up to that challenge and that opportunity, especially as the US elections are now over. Many people said before in the last year, not much is going to happen because of the American elections. Well, thank goodness President Obama has won. Thank goodness he has a second term. And now it's time that we make sure, uh, Britain and the rest of the European Union, that the Americans with us can step up to the challenge and the important opportunity to start those negotiations and address the point that Robert Turner's made, which is, which is what I was trying to say, but he said it much more eloquently than I could have done, which is that th this point about freedom of movement, access, uh, access to markets, uh, when you talk to business people uh, from Gaza or the West Bank, this is a huge issue. Or when you look at the everyday lack of movement at an everyday level uh, for people, ordinary citizens in those countries who are peaceful, um, uh, the fact that they can't get to work for hours uh, in the West Bank, where I visited a couple of years ago, um, is just scandalous. And that kind of everyday experience is an inhibitor, not just to economic activity, but to people's well-being. And, and so the situation in Gaza is obviously much, much worse. So the political assistance and the need for negotiation to open up the scope to address these long-term challenges is of paramount importance and we need to make sure that happens as soon as possible because we only have a tiny window of opportunity, if that, to make sure that the international community takes, ac takes action now. Well, let's see if uh, Obama can deliver on these lofty aspirations of putting pressure when he hasn't but let's see. That's another. That's another discussion so for another day. they're not lofty because they affect people's people's ability yeah, to get along. they're not happening when they're not happening. Absolutely, they, they, they become, need to. Yeah. They become lofty. Yeah, absolutely. Right. What did you hear from Palestinians themselves in Gaza, Simon? When about their expectations from the outside world? 
especially after the Arab Spring, have they, do they feel that the world has forgotten them and they've got different priorities now, the rest of the Arab world and the international community? Um, well, when we were conducting research for, for this study, it was actually quite soon after the Egyptian elections. So there was, there was actually quite a lot of optimism in Gaza that the Arab Spring there would, would lead to, to big changes. Um, I don't. I don't think that optimism has really been fulfilled, or or looks likely to be in the near future. Um, I could imagine that that the mood is slightly less optimistic now. Um, I, I think people people talk, talked about assistance. Had l had a lot of opinions about the international community operating in Gaza. People felt that there was a very big role in their lives for help. Um, that they were really struggling to meet the needs of of their own households and that that assistance from organizations was necessary but at the same time the kind of people the kind of help that people stressed was really the kind that would lead to self-sufficiency a, a self-sufficiency which, which a lot of those households had just years ago mm. um, that they wanted to regain um, so in, in talking about practical programs people wanted livelihoods um, programming they wanted assets that would allow them to have their own businesses um, or to restore businesses that had been destroyed mm -hmm. in, the, in the course of military operations um, and they also wanted things from their own political leaders um, both in terms of assistance both in terms of um, sort of uh, people brought up the, the, the division between um, Fatah and Hamas a lot mm -hmm. was something that was mm -hmm. A, a deeply felt priority and and what they saw as, as being crucial to to things improving um, so I think I think people people stressed that the international community had a role to play that they wanted it to be a role that was empowering for for Palestinians first and foremost so they want a role but do they expect a role or are they resign to the fact that the world is forgotten um, no I think they expect a role Pe people expressed I think at times, uh, um, a lot of a lot of faith in the role that the, the, the that UNRWA played in their lives, that, mm. that different forms of assistance had done so. Um, um, on a political level, um, I think it was considerably more mixed. Mm. I, I wonder about the effect, I'm sure lots of people wonder about the effect of this long-term dependence on, on aid. And I want to ask uh, Sarah Adamsik, do you feel that this, because you know, you mentioned in your report that there is overwhelmingly uh, the respondents called for measures to improve their self-reliance. Evidence suggests that Palestinians in Gaza are becoming increasingly aid reliant. Sarah, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, definitely have to uh, definitely agree with that. And if you're talking long-term dependence, I mean, we can look at the conflict. Uh, as long term, but realistically, when we're looking at the blockade, that's you know going back about five and a half, six, uh, going on six years now. So this is the time period people are really looking at where the most acutely affected import of construction materials, um, access to markets. You know, it had been it, 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 the blockade obviously did not start suddenly in, in 2007, but there had been a build up uh, since the second intifada. But that really was a, a turning point in terms of freedom of movement and access to markets. Uh, we recently did you know, focus group discussions for shelter research on families suffering from overcrowding. And we asked them, you know, they cited all the reasons Simone had said at the start about overcrowding and its impact. What is the solution? You know, what do you see as, as being the solution? And it, hands down was you know, um, access to employment. We want to work in Israel. We want jobs. Um, if we're going to farm land, we need to have access to markets in Europe to sell strawberries, to sell flowers. We have land, but we can't actually afford to build on it. So, I, I mean, I think Robert Turner had said it earlier, but this, you know, we can keep going at the same level and pouring money into aid and increasingly aid-dependent um, commu community, but mm -hmm. the underlying cause and the underlying solution is clear, I think, to most people who are working in Gaza. Mm -hmm. But is, is that a worry that Gaza becomes a, a reliant society, a, a reliant economy when it exists? Is that I mean, a major worry? That the self-initiative of, of a whole society would be destroyed and it becomes just reliant, a, a reliant society? I mean, I think that's a risk. You, we're looking now, you know, since the ceasefire, um, 
have people started or are they willing to access areas in the access, what is called the access restricted area, the buffer zone? Are farmers willing to come back? And you know, we're starting, I mean, this is very early stages, but you know, are there some people who are just at this point permanently unemployed or not willing to return? And I don't think we have the answer. I don't think the opportunity has been given to Palestinians in Gaza to even just try to return. So it really would be just speculation. You know, I think, I think the opportunity needs to be there first. And, uh, okay, th there's something very interesting in the report that you said the situation is yet more difficult for poor non-refugees because they can't access uh, the aid. Yeah. It's a funny situation mm -hmm. that the refugee yeah. is better off than the non-refugee. Yeah, I, I, th I think um, in Gaza a, lo a lot of things are the opposite of what you would expect. Mm -hmm. um, it's water you can't drink and non-refugees are in a, in a worse situation than than mm -hmm. refugees. Um, th there are actors that uh, sort of are have partially taken on uh, providing assistance to non-refugee households who mm -hmm. don't fall under the scope of, of UNRWA assistance, but based on our interviews, um, sort of uh, coverage on the ground or, or reception of that aid was just much more patchy. Um, People also complained that uh, aid that went through national structures was very much subject to politicization. So that it went mm -hmm. to people who supported particular Palestinian parties. Um, and that was really a, 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 a complaint that cropped up again and again um, across mm -hmm. the Gaza Strip. And one of the, the primary reasons that we found in our study that, that non-refugees um, had more precarious access to, to assistance. And the hopes that people had for Hamas that they would do with cronyism, has that been, uh, has that evaporated now? Um, Are they being accused of? I, I, in, in our focus groups, people didn't speak extensively about Hamas. Um, I, don't, I don't know how much that relates to the priority that that has in their lives or just a, a sense of what w it is possible to say in, in, in that kind of um that situation, so <laughs> I, I can't speculate to a large degree what how people feel about um, Hamas's potential to, to deal with corruption. But okay. And Ahmed Abu Tawahina, is that your experience? That in many cases the, the non-refugees are worse off than the refugees? Because they don't have access the same access to aid? Absolutely. In a way, it's a privilege to be a refugee. As if this is the extraordinary citizenship here in Palestine. In order to be able to access some food aid uh, resources in the Gaza. And is that it? That's the basic, that's the denominator for... You know, it is aid. So we go back to this point that, you know, the, the basic denominator is aid. Are, are you worried about this? Are, are you worried that no, well, someone... Thinks being a refugee international is better off. Are, uh, international reports are talking about uh, something like 75 percent of the total families in Gaza Strip are relying on food aid, as if food aid is going to solve the problem of the Palestinians. And, I, and it seems that the international community is releasing the Israelis and taking some responsibilities on behalf of Israel. This is the responsibility of the uh, occupying force. They should think, find out, they should uh, respect all resolutions and international agreements in regard of uh, civilians under occupation. International community would uh, come up and pump a lot of uh, humanitarian aid after each Israeli incursion. On, uh, from my perspective as a mental health professional, it's to heal the guilty feelings among those human beings outside. But, but it's not only to, to support Palestinians. But who is <coughs> responsible for the assistance of, of Palestinians in Gaza? <coughs> I, Israel says it's not responsible. Is, is that <coughs> Robert Turner? Is, who's responsible? Yeah, but if I could just go back, Sam, on your earlier question about refugees as a privileged population. I think if you look at the poverty rates, you look at the food insecurity rates, you look at unemployment, uh, the refugee and non-refugees are almost the same. Unemployment rates amongst refugees are slightly higher, but poverty rates and food insecurity are very similar. I think part of the answer to this question about uh, the perception that refugees are better serviced is that, that they only have to go to UNRWA. So they get their, their 
social safety net is through UNRWA, their education is through UNRWA, their primary health care is through UNRWA. So they only have to go to one provider. If you're a non-refugee, you get some assistance from the authorities. You maybe get some assistance from the World Food Program. Maybe you get some assistance from UNICEF. Maybe you get some assistance from a, from a group of NGOs, from, from CBOs, from local NGOs. So I think some of this perception about refugees being privileged is really just that division. Um, because as I say, at the end of the day, the result statistically is effectively a wash between the two. I think one difference is um, that UNRWA has had more success the last, since the easing of the restrictions in 2010 uh, in the construction of housing. So uh, those that were displaced uh, have a greater likelihood of a received uh, shelter assistance uh, from UNRWA, so if they were a refugee. Um, Sorry, and then repeat, sorry, the, the follow-up question? Uh, I was talking about the responsibility, uh, and this is something that the report touched on, that, that who is responsible, ultimately, for the plight of refugees in Gaza? For refugees, for refugees it's UNRWA, and that's by a GA mandate that goes back to 1948-89, operationalized in 1950. Um, yeah, the, the, for example, the, the Convention on Refugees uh, does not apply to Palestinian refugees. By, by it's, it's explicitly in the convention. So the Palestinian um, the, the, authority is, is, has no responsibility. Uh, the overall responsibility for provision of basic service falls to UNRWA. And but that doesn't mean that they're they're, they're not excluded from assistance from the Palestinian Authority. Okay. That's and okay. for example, in the West Bank, in the West Bank, I believe the majority of refugee children go to, to public schools uh, administered by the PA. Mm -hmm. But we have a mandated responsibility to provide that service. Uh, okay. So the Palestinian Authority has no legal responsibility. Uh, yeah, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, you probably shouldn't quote me on that, but that's my understanding. Do you, does anyone? Do you know who's got responsibility, ultimate responsibility, for refugees in Gaza? Well, for people in Gaza. Well, I would say I would say UNRWA, as as Robert has said. My understanding is it is but UNRWA. But if, if if Gaza is an occupied territory, then doesn't the occupying power have any responsibility over the residents of that area? Yeah, of course they do. But that's different from the provision of basic service to a specific component of the population that is. It's been set, uh, set aside by a General Assembly mandate. Okay, we should have had a lawyer. Because I'd like to know. Should have a lawyer. Um, we should have had a lawyer. Because who, who is. one in the audience. So when we is, get there, the is there an students. international lawyer, someone who can answer this question? Who is responsible for Gaza? So you need a, a Palestinian lawyer, an Israeli lawyer. <laughs> and then they would argue. So <laughs> and then the alcohol Yes, yeah. <laughs> Any, any thoughts on this? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I wanted to say I, I, I don't have an answer to that question. Even even describing the issue in the report was really fraught with... Um, well, the issue of responsibility. With, with complications and responsibility, yes. When, you, when, you, when you're also talking about um, displacement and who who is responsible for coordinating the response and standardizing assistance and saying that um, sort of all displaced households are entitled to X or Y if they've suffered this or that... Um, one of our recommendations was that uh, both Hamas and the Palestinian Authority establish a legal and administrative framework for displacement um, because there isn't currently one that exists um, in either of those administrations. And that would be based along the lines of the guiding principles for internal displacement, for instance, um, uh, or either guiding international documents. And that that could be binding for all the authorities concerned be negotiated in tandem with other actors that have responsibilities such as UNRWA and um, with the international community and other national actors. Mm. Do you think, d are, are, you, are you optimistic? Do you think things can, because there's something very interesting in your report actually, and I'd like to, to hear what you think of it. It says, um, In practice, the blockade, uh, in, in, in practice, that if things improve and the situation is back to normal, with long-term support from UNRWA, if the blockade were lifted, 
and construction went ahead, most of the currently registered caseload of displaced people would be rehoused by 2013. That that's not a typo, is it? Um, I think that that's that statistic might have changed um, yeah. in yeah, the yeah, intervening in time. It was based on projections around when people thought building how long it would take to complete reconstruction projects, which are dependent upon. So it's it's been but it's adjusted but it's to but what? Fa but fairly but fairly quickly, I think is it could be substituted for 2013. Mm -hmm. So there's 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 been money pledged for reconstruction projects that would cover as we've a, heard, a large majority of the caseload. Money pledged doesn't always translate into money delivered. How do you see things developing, just for Gazans, humanitarian? Well, I, I think the question is, w what, when, at what point is normal? Which point in history are, re are, you, are we referring to as normal? Um, because depending on where your starting point is, um, you know, things look very different. But I, I, I don't feel very optimistic uh, about uh, the future. Uh, because what we have is, over the past few years, very little progress in international negotiations, as you, as you rightly pointed out, and there's a great deal of frustration uh, among uh, people who want to see a solution. Um, and in terms of the stories we've, and the testimonies we've heard, both, both in the report as well as what's happening in Gaza, there isn't uh, much room for hopefulness. But I would stress a but, which is that there is still time, there is still scope for salvaging the situation if we can apply the right kind of pressure on our political leaders to take, uh, to step up and take the action necessary to apply the pressure on um, the Israeli authorities to at least relieve some of the short-term pressures to address your point about immediate assistance and immediate support, uh, immediate uh, scope for freedom of movement and opportunities for uh, trading and economic activity. Uh, but the long-term solutions will have to lie in uh, a political solution. I don't feel optimistic about it, but I do believe that we need to apply pressure to create the room for optimism because uh, because there is too much at stake. And I just want to touch on the points that were referred to in the earlier statements by other speakers. Um, Ahmed uh, eloquently highlighted the, si the psychological uh, challenges uh, people face, the, uh, the, the problems with people um, being uh, treated in this way and the mental health uh, ramifications, the sense of frustration with not being able to realize your potential, uh, even when you have done incredibly well in the education system. that All of that is an absolute recipe for disaster uh, in the future and risks creating a, a, a level of hopelessness that what you get is further conflict and further animosity built on what we already have. So we I don't feel very optimistic about where we are right now, but I do think that we in the international community as citizens, as campaigners, as NGOs, um, people who care passionately about wanting to see uh, peace in the region have to work together to apply pressure on governments around the world who uh, need, th need public pressure uh, in order to step up to getting the negotiations uh, started again. Well, you mentioned where these all this would lead, and I'll tell you what these guys th think. Simon and your co-author Wasim Sarraj, you think that according to the UN, if the economy remains closed by 2020, Gaza may be unlivable. So that's where things could be heading if uh, the UN is, is correct. How does that make you feel, Ahmed uh, Abu Tawahina? Unlivable. Unlivable by 2020 if the economy remains closed. It's already un unlivable. Yeah. You know, we shouldn't wait until 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Life in Gaza Strip couldn't be tolerated at all. Okay, but sadly it could get worse. As 
that, well, well, we will see. We hope not, but we will see. It's unlivable, man, uh, unlivable now. Sarah, what's uh, your last thoughts on this, on the future? Yeah, actually, if I can um, go back, and uh, this can be my the final thoughts, but your point before about if the blockade were lifted tomorrow, then basically the existing housing uh, would be, you know, reconstruction would be finished by end of 2013. Just to clarify that that applies really just to houses destroyed or damaged, or major damage by Israeli military op operations pre-cast lead, during cast lead, and post-cast lead. It doesn't at all address basically what is an estimated 70,000 unmet housing needs in Gaza, um, refugee camps that ha have not been expanded at all since the 1950s. So, and Robert Turner could probably provide more on the size that they were initially meant to uh, house versus what they currently do, and just the general substandard housing conditions, overcrowding uh, throughout Gaza. So as, as um, Simone said at the start, you know, the displaced in Gaza are perhaps you know, not differently affected than everyone else in, uh, and other Palestinians in Gaza, but very acutely so. So those who are displaced you know, suffer what everyone else does in Gaza, but even more so. Um, and I think that's, that was you know, the kind of focus that came out from the report. Okay, thanks, Sarah. And uh, Robert? It, it, it looks from the report that compared to other cities, overcrowding, overcrowded cities in Asia and Africa, the refugees in Gaza seem to be having, you know, the, the honor of, and that seems to be their biggest plus. Yeah, it's a small victory, I would say. Um, the, I mean, as Ahmed said, the, the, the place is largely unlivable now if you, if you tally it all up. I mean, the, the economic situation, the infrastructure situation, the psychosocial um, situation of, of, of effectively being trapped and, and hopeless. And as the Gaza 2020 report lays out, that's only going to get worse. So um, in the absence of, of, of political progress, and by my earlier comment about, about pressure on easing movement, I wasn't suggesting that, that there, you know, we're talking about the overall peace uh, on the final status issues, but just some movement on the restrictions and, and allowing access to markets and allowing access to jobs. Um, in the absence of that, and, and given all of the other challenges, um, it's just going to get worse. And I don't know what, I don't know what terms you use to describe that, um, but it's awful Little. now. Going to be much worse. Mm. Well, you know, I think we'll, you know, we'll see. People cope with things that you, you don't think they can cope with. I think if five years ago, six years ago, you were to say, in 2013, uh, there'd be 44% food insecurity, there'd be 33% unemployment rate, uh, that 80% of the population would be age dependent, that only 700 people a day out of a population of 1.7 million actually leave the place. You'd have a generation of people who'd had no opportunity, despite their education, to have a job. Um, people would have thought that that was unlivable. So we wait. We wait and see. And Simon, you wrote, co-authored this report. What, what are the things that we should keep in mind at the end? What about the potential for the future? Mm. Um, I, I think it's it, it's often very hard to keep in mind everything you need to keep in mind. It, you, you tend to play a tennis match with in thinking about things in Gaza where you well think... Give us two things to keep in mind. Yeah, two things to keep in mind. Just just that, that there is there is so much potential for things to, to improve if there was a, a political resolution. Mm -hmm. I think that there's there's a lot in place that um, other, other, other parts of the world that we've looked at in the course of this series of reports don't have in terms of people willing to to cater to the needs of people who are displaced, who are in overcrowded <coughs> conditions, to, um, and that that's a basis that that a, a much healthier Gazan society could be based on. So I'll leave it on a more optimistic note. Very good, very good. Okay, Q and A. Who's got questions? Because <coughs> I've got a page full of notes and questions. I've asked some of them, but I I will wait to hear yours. Could you wait for the microphone? 